Good morning, Dethane. Dethane has joined us online. Um, so as I said earlier, we're at the uh, sixth week of our 12-week uh, Truth of Happiness Dhamma study. We began with uh, a look at the, the jhana meditation method. Uh, then the second week, um, we studied the four foundations of mindfulness where the Buddha teaches what to do during jhana meditation. Uh, and then to apply that to other themes, apply that deepening concentration to other themes of the Dhamma. Um, then we looked at the Four Noble Truths and, uh, and the entire context of what the Buddha taught. Um, the significant thing about that, just briefly, is that the Four Noble Truths are <clears throat> noble truths and they relate directly to the Dhamma as opposed to things that are true but have no bearing on the Dhamma. In other, in, I think I always used it. Uh, the, the sky is blue is true. Uh, I think I said last week that Lorna's hair is short but not as short as mine. A true statement, but it has nothing to do with the Dhamma. We can study my hair as long as we want or study why the sky is blue as long as we want and we might gain some expert knowledge. It might be interesting to some people to be able to describe why a sky is blue. I used to know, Tim knows. Um, but it has absolutely no bearing on the Dhamma. And if I believe it's so, if I believe that my liberation rests on me understanding why the sky is blue, and I spend my life chasing that aspect of spirituality, I've wasted my life, haven't I? Because it has no bearing on a noble truth. So the four noble truths are noble. They're, they relate directly to the Dhamma, and they are the Dhamma. The first noble truth is that as a consequence of having a human life, stress and suffering will occur. The, the profound nature of that is to teach us that there is nothing at all personal in life. Whether something is, is uh, seen as pleasurable or, plain, or painful or simply um, uh, meaningless, that we're, we're ambiguous to it, is just the way life is. When we start taking it personal is when we get into trouble. When we do take uh, our lives personally, because of ignorance of these four noble truths. And that instills in us a craving for and a clinging to fabricated beliefs of how we are in relation to the world. In other words, the beliefs that we use to establish ourselves in the world are fabricated beliefs. But since I'm the one that came up with them in agreement with everyone else in the world, that's who I am. And because I don't know any better, I'm gonna to cling tenaciously to those fabricated views, no matter how much stress and suffering no matter how obvious it is to any rational thinking human being that these must be wrong views. But that's the nature of ignorance, to create very powerful and subtle strategies to ignore its own ignorance. That's why, and it brings us right to where we are today, that's why we need a concentration practice, a meditation practice that deepens concentration as a direct counter that, to that constant preoccupation with self. And unless we have that structure, everything we do is just to use the phrase, is just feeding the ego. We might be able to feed the ego and, and, and satiate the ego by creating something called a spiritual practice that we decide that since we're doing this, we're covering our bases. In other words, when we die, we'll get some reward for what we're doing right now. And that is the essence of ignorance, isn't it? Because every time I'm doing something now, so I feel better tomorrow, or I have a better situation tomorrow or in next life, I've lost my mind. I'm no longer in my body. I've lost my mind and I've lost my life. I might go through the motions. In fact, I might have the most successful life anybody could consider. I might become, and again, just to use the example, I might become the president of the United States, but with a troubled mind, I can't even enjoy that, can I? The Buddha's Dhamma rests in the concentration that we're going to be talking about in just a moment that supports the overarching themes of the Dhamma. Let me get to this. So I'm, um, uh, how many of you read this week's chapter? Yeah, good, 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 good. So I'm going to start about uh, about a quarter way through, um, a little bit after where I left off, what's today, Saturday, on Tuesday. And I, I don't think I'm going to get through the whole chapter, but since you read it all, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to start um, going back a little bit with right effort, but, it, but as I'm reading this, be mindful that this relates directly to concentration. The Buddha describes right effort succinctly. Abandon what is unskillful. 
What is unskillful is craving for and clinging to all views rooted in ignorance of four noble truths. That's the most basic thing that we need to understand. Abandon what is unskillful and develop what is skillful. What is skillful is the Eightfold Path. So this points to what I say often, that each moment holds the potential to either continue to incline our minds towards further ignorance or incline our minds towards awakening. That is the only choice we have in each moment. And when that choice is framed by the Eightfold Path, we'll make choices based on that right view. Is that clear? So it's not an accident that we start living our lives in accordance with these principles known as an Eightfold Path. It's as a direct result of our own right efforts that the Buddha is describing here. Abandon what is unskillful and develop what is skillful. Really can't be any, any simpler than that. Then the Buddha continues. <clears throat> One of the things that, that strikes me as I'm reading, as I started reading the suttas and, and um, really developing, it sounds kind of crazy, but developing a, a an impersonal personal relationship with this guy called Siddhartha Gautama. Because it, it, this is a good example of where his, just his encouragement for all of us from 2,600 years ago, it can still be felt in what he's saying here. If it were not possible to abandon what is unskillful and develop what is skillful, I would not teach it. If it were harmful to abandon what is unskillful and develop what is skillful, I would not teach it. Apply your efforts to develop what is skillful. There's no downside is what the Buddha is saying. The focus of thoughts determines experience. Thoughts pre preoccupied with clinging, craving, and aversion will simply lead to more confusion and stress. Thoughts concentrated on mindfulness of the Dhamma will bring liberation and freedom. Distracted thoughts focused on fleeting desires and achievements and acquisitions can only lead to more confusion and stress. Thoughts and actions that create additional self-identities, -identi even altruistic identities, can only lead to more confusion and stress. Just a good, you know, extreme example of that would be the Christian Crusades or the modern uh, jihadists. The Christian Crusades and the modern jihadists believe 100% in what they're doing. And they think that there's some benefit, at least just to them and their group, to killing other people that don't believe what you believe. Uh, it, it's, it sounds outrageous to most human beings, and yet that's a very common occurrence within humanity. And why does it occur? And why does it continue to occur in different ways? Because humanity continues to be rooted in ignorance. There's no mystery to why we, we, we harm other people. There's absolutely no mystery. If human beings were able to think naturally within the framework of the Eightfold Path, the first time when Cain killed Abel, that would be the last, the very first and very last murder we've ever seen. The very first and last violence inflicted on a human being would have began and ended right there because we would have realized how ridiculous it is, not how wrong it is. Forget the moral aspects of taking another human being's life. That's bad enough. What a waste of wrong effort, isn't it? And you think about all the things that go behind that horrible act and the usual justification that follows the perpetrator of that act. It's insane, isn't it? And yet we've murdered as a, as a human, I'm, I'm really planning on getting into this, <laughs> but here I am. This is, a, this is an ongoing constant occurrence, isn't it? Rather than learn from the first time one human being took another human being's life, we haven't learned a damn thing, have we? Why? Because we're looking in the wrong place. That's the essence of ignorance. The essence of ignorance is not knowing. And in this case, what the Buddha is teaching us that we don't know, what's significant is not that I don't understand why the sky is blue. I don't understand human life as described as Four Noble Truths. And in order to do so, in order to develop that understanding, the very first thing I need to do is to develop a measure of concentration why? It relates to what I just said, so we know where to look. And it really is that simple. Thoughts that establish and reinforce the ego personality in any manner, in any realm, can only lead to more confusion and stress for the ego personality. And that, that line, in any realm, relates to what the Buddha teaches, too. The, the, just the fact that people talk about non-physical establishments as something um, 
useful and remarkable and something we should chase after. The Buddha knows it's just a speculation. There's absolutely, it doesn't matter how many people through how many centuries believe in something that's not true, cannot make it true. As Dharma practitioners, the only thing we are concerned about is truth or four noble truths. Everything else is speculation. Everything else is to be recognized as such and abandoned. We had a little bit of talk this morning with, with Tim, but all of those um, suttas, like the Vachagoda Sutta, <clears throat> where Vachagoda keeps coming back to the Buddha with these grand questions. Where do you come from? Where do you go after death? Where do I come from? Is the soul eternal or, or not eternal? Is life finite or infinite? And every time the Buddha would say, Vachagoda, it's your questions that are confusing you. Let go of the questions. To a self-referential ego self that's concerned about how am I going to continue to establish myself, that's the biggest question, isn't it? And we've been asking that question since the beginning of time. Where do I come from? Where am I going? And we create these speculative so-called religions and spiritual philosophies to explain that to ourselves. We're the wizard. We're the ones behind the curtain playing this game on ourselves. But because we insist on creating an establishment of a, of a fabricated ego self, we have to create these very elaborate strategies to keep it going. The fact that many, many people believe it doesn't make it true. We'll come back to four noble truths, right? Is everybody following me where I'm going with this? The grand questions simply don't matter. <clears throat> to someone, to a, to a, someone who's, who wants to develop an understanding of who they are in relation to the world, those big questions don't matter. They're a complete distraction. What does matter is stress arises, dukkha arises, craving for and clinging for to ignorant views is a cause. It's possible to end this process, and the Eightfold Path is the path to focus on, to develop this cessation. Mindfulness in the context of the Four Noble Truths is to abandon the distraction of stress arising from clinging and remain focused on the Eightfold Path. That's also the beginning of right view, isn't it? Mindfulness of the entire Eightfold Path develops understanding that will end the confusion and suffering of the ego personality. Mindfulness of the entire Eightfold Path develops understanding that will end the, the, the confusion and suffering of the ego personality. There are many useful applications of mindfulness. Some applications of mindfulness techniques have greatly enhanced the health field in dealing with pain and stress. I'm talking about mindfulness-based stress reduction. Excuse me. And not just, but that's, that's the most well-known. Uh, practice out there for that. Lost my place, sorry about that. Mindfulness techniques when applied in the context, in this context are often successful in achieving this purpose. So again, the point I'm making is mindfulness-based stress reduction or mindfulness applied in healthy ways is fine, it's useful. I would encourage it. But it's very important to understand that, and just using the example of, of MBSR, that's not the mindfulness that the Buddha taught. It's useful mindfulness. Being mindful of driving when I'm driving a car is useful mindfulness. But that's a consequence of Dhamma practice rather than a focus of Dhamma practice. In other words, me sitting in my car thinking about how wonderful I am that I'm mindful of driving is just another distraction, isn't it? There's, there's no... Dhamma practice there. I'm not gaining any insight into four noble truths, but it's good to be mindful when driving. But that is a consequence of a deepening concentration practice. What's important while I'm driving is to be mindful that I'm driving in relation to the Eightfold Path. So while I'm driving and mindful of I'm driving and being careful of the speed limit and anybody around me and somebody cuts me off, the Eightfold Path informs me, I don't have to lose my mind right now. That's the practice of, of the Dhamma in that situation. The mindfulness of the Dhamma is to develop an understanding of the Four Noble Truths. Understanding the Four Noble Truths brings an end to confusion and suffering arising from clinging to an ego personality. Right mindfulness is to be, these are the Buddha's, the Buddha's description of right mindfulness. Be mindful to abandon wrong view and enter and remain in right view. Makes sense, doesn't it? To be mindful, what does that mean? Mindfulness means to recollect or to hold in mind. So as, as we're developing our Dhamma practice, 
and we find that we're caught up in a, uh, a greedy thought, we simply remind ourselves, wait a minute, I'm being mindful of something that is hurtful. Abandon what is hurtful and enter and remain in what is part of the Dhamma. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not what I am. And again, it's, it's practicing the Dhamma at the point of contact. The only place we can, I should say, the only occurrence that we can practice a Dhamma is right here and right now. We can prepare for it. We can think about it. We can read about it. We can sit on our cushions so that off our cushions, we remain well secluded from the world. But as part of that symbiotic process, excuse me, it's part of the symbiotic process that's rooted in where we began in jhana meditation that supports just exactly what we're doing in this Dhamma study. We began with that jhana technique so that we were able to understand, even if it's just at a beginning level, the four foundations of mindfulness and how to apply it. And then we move to the next week, which is applying that concentration and now a little bit of refined mindfulness to the actual Four Noble Truths. And now we're progressing through the Eightfold Path. Does everybody see what I'm talking about here? This is a methodical application of concentration as the Buddha taught it. In other words, we didn't start this practice and have a week on the benefits of praying to Avalokiteshvara and another week on learning how to, how to properly bow and another week how to project our thoughts into Tulsita Buddhist heaven. Do you understand what I'm saying? And a fourth week yet on advanced chanting me methods. There's no Dhamma there, is there? We would all feel like we're doing something and your teacher would be distracting you simply further down the line. It's okay if we're not calling this the Buddha's Dhamma because we're not making any inferences. But when we're calling this the Buddha's Dhamma, this is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. This is what the Buddha taught. Be mindful to abandon wrong intention and enter remain in right intention. Be mindful to abandon wrong speech and enter remain in right speech. Be mindful to abandon wrong action and enter remain in right action. Be mindful to abandon wrong livelihood and enter and remain in right livelihood. Be mindful to abandon wrong effort and enter and remain in right effort. Be mindful to abandon wrong mindfulness and enter and remain in right mindfulness. Be mindful to abandon wrong meditation and enter and remain in right meditation. All, again, the, the Buddha's description of mindfulness is applied directly to the Eightfold Path and really nothing else because that's all that matters. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I covered most of this in, this in my comments earlier. The four found, is anybody following along in the book? Oh, okay. I don't have a page number, so I just, <laughs> uh, I just, I just, I'm going just past my uh, italicized comments, if that helps. The four foundations of mindfulness is taught to bring immediate mindfulness of what is occurring during jhana meditation. Mindfulness is the quality of mind that supports le developing lasting peace and happiness. Practicing mindfulness within the framework of the Four Noble Truths is straightforward, accessible, and easily understood in practice. The four foundations of mindfulness are, I'm going to skip over this because I just talked about that. And I'm going to skip ahead. <laughs> uh, Quite a, quite a bit. Um, I don't really have any way to tell you. I'm going to start with recognition of the initiation, if that helps. Probably four or five pages ahead. What do you mean? Recognition of the initiation of eye making develops the ability to bring to bring continued eye making to cessation. We talk about that all the time. And again, that's an application of proper application of concentration mm -hmm. and the refined mindfulness of what to hold in mind. In this moment, am I engaged in eye making or not? Mindfulness is a dispassionate focused awareness on whatever is arising in the present moment without being distracted by any judgments or discriminating thoughts. Being mindful of feelings as feelings arise allows the feeling to dissipate and allows a deeper tranquility to develop. If a physical sensation arises, such as pain or discomfort, in some area of your body, remain mindful of the sensation of breathing. 
Note the physical sensation and the immediate self-identification. Again, <clears throat> do not judge the physical sensation in any way. Do not wish that you are not having the experience of discomfort. discomfort. Simply note the experience while maintaining mindfulness of your breath. Um, one of the things that's often taught today uh, is that if you have pain in your body to breathe into that pain. I think everybody, has anybody not heard that technique? Breathe into your pain. Can anybody actually do that? So we're teaching ourselves, again, there might be some benefit to it. But the Buddha's Dhamma is all about abandoning ignorance. And why would we create a practice over something that is obviously rooted in ignorance? We cannot breathe anywhere in our bodies except into our lungs. And that's how we should treat jhana meditation. We should br simply breathe. It, pardon me? <laughs> Yes. If you have pain in your chest, sorry, sorry, sorry. no, you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. If, if, you, if you have pain in your chest, breathe. <laughs> well, yeah, go to your emergency room. But, and and that, that's, you know, <laughs> it, yeah, if you have pain in your chest, try not just to breathe into your chest. Go to the emergency room. But there are those who say, I'm just breathing. I hope nobody would ever say, breathe into your chest when you're having a heart attack. The point of it is that the, the Buddha teaches a very stark reality that a self-referential ego personality doesn't want anything to do with. So it will create scenarios like, well, I'm going to meditate, but my meditation is going to be breathing into the pain that I have. Well, you're not meditating, are you? So that's the point. If you find that breathing into your pain is helpful, go ahead and do it. But don't consider it meditation practice because it's not. Being mindful of physical sensations without further judgment often will minimize the sensation. Again, the, what the Buddha teaches us to do when we are feeling a pain, which is feeling pain, which is a feeling, is to not be distracted by it in our meditation. And how do we do that? Well, when we notice that we're caught up in pain, and it could be severe pain, to come back to the breath. And in that moment, we're deepening concentration, even if in the next moment, I'm, I'm aware of my, the screaming pain in my leg. And what do I do about it then? I take another breath. The pain is not distracting me from deepening concentration. In fact, it's just more fodder for concentration, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If I'm treating it correctly, if I'm treating it with aversion, in other words, in my meditation, I cannot have pain or I can't meditate. I can't meditate, can I? But I can't meditate because I told myself I can't <laughs> meditate. It's not because I can't meditate. Is everybody following me? It's a fabrication. And, they, and again, we, the, the, the fabricated mind will take that to an extreme. Well, what about when the pain is just too much to meditate? What should we do when the pain is just too much to meditate? Breathe. Breathe. Yeah, maybe go to a hospital and maybe not meditate right then. And that's okay. Yeah, I was going to say, isn't it okay to just get up, shake it off for a second and then sit down again? It absolutely is. In fact, that's, excuse me. No, one pain that's the recommendation. One pain is beyond all pains. It's childhood abandoned. And the one thing that they tell you is to breathe. Breathe, yeah. <laughs> because, because it brings you back into your body and it helps minimize what's occurring. Yes, You're not, that's right. Yeah, I mean, and, I, and it doesn't take the pain. I mean, I, I would oh, guess that it, it doesn't take the pain away. Right, but it does make it subside away for itself. Yeah. yeah. So, it, again, it, it's, all, it's all good advice. I'm not putting down modern mindfulness at all. Um, but to understand that mindfulness means to recollect or to hold in mind. And we can do that with anything. We can do it with something that is uh, wholesome and altruistic, but is, is also a distraction. So as far as the Dhamma is concerned, we hold in mind the Eightfold Path. And then from that, from developing that, then we are simply mindful of everything that's occurring in our life without the compulsive need to check, am I being mindful while I'm driving? Am I mindful right now when I'm talking? That's just another distraction, isn't it? And so we've created a, a modern religion called mindfulness and we worship that, that compulsive need to be mindful of, of each and every moment. Well, that's not what the Buddha's talking about. He's talking about a well-concentrated mind that holds in mind the refined mindfulness of the Eightfold Path that allows us to be mindfully present with life as life occurs in a natural and peaceful way. Okay, I'm not gonna go too much further. Being mindful of physical sensations without 
further judgment often will minimize the sensation. Returning your mindfulness to your breath interrupts your reaction to physical and emotional feelings. This is the second foundation of mindfulness, being mindful that through the five physical senses and consciousness, feelings arise within. Being mindful of feelings, being ardent and aware of feelings as feelings arise, begins to the deconditioned conditioned mind by interrupting the discursive and self-perpetuating judgments and analysis of feelings. And we do that all, in fact, we're encouraged by most modern <clears throat> so-called psychological practices to analyze to death our feelings. Why am I having this feeling? Where is it coming from? Who gave it to me? What's the cause of it? Which lifetime did it first arise? In? It's just a feeling. There's, there's nothing of any, there's nothing of any value or benefit that can be gleaned from analyzing an impermanent fabricated feeling. How could there be? My relationship to whatever feeling is arising from a mind that's still rooted in ignorance is an ignorant relationship. There's nothing that can be learned except further um, self-centered, self-consumed analysis of my feeling. I have a feeling. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to know where it came from. I'm going to spend the rest, the next 20 years in therapy figuring out this feeling. And once I figure this one out, I bet you there's another one behind it to keep the train, the self-centered train going. And when you start from the premise that there's something wrong and you never get off that, or that there's something that this self needs in order to be, to function well in the world, you're lost completely because you never get there. But when we sit down within the framework of the Eightfold Path and deep in concentration and are given this framework to watch what we're doing to ourselves, we realize we're the wizard behind the curtain. We're doing it to ourselves. It's, there's nothing being done or imposed on us in any way by the world, by God, by Lucifer, by bad Buddhist saints, by anything. Every measure of distress that's within our body that we're reacting to is caused by us, by wanting it to be different than it is. And the counter, the, the profound counter is a mind resting in concentration, supporting the refined mindfulness that simply sees things as they are and leaves them alone. It's awake, that's an awakened mind. Totally unencumbered and disentangled from the world. That's a mind resting in concentration. Let me go just a little further. Simply and dispassionately be mindful of feelings as feelings arise while maintaining mindfulness of the breath. Excuse me. John, I have a quick question on that. Um, <clears throat> would it be bad? So you could work with your feeling and just go back to your breath, acknowledge your feeling, go back to your breath. Yes. Or you can look at your feeling as a manifestation of suffering and wonder, where am I clinging and try to drop but that feels more analytical. Yep. Would that be okay or no? No. In <laughs> no. and meditation, but that that's a that is a thought to consider off our cushions while it's occurring. Do you, do you see the difference? In meditation, we're preparing our minds to have the concentration to be able to do just what you described in 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 application. In life as life occurs. It's, a, it's such a great question. Thank you for the question. Again, not, it, it cannot be overemphasized. Meditation is for deepening concentration, period. And if we use it that way, we will then develop the concentration necessary for complete liberation, because then we can, we can engage in our moment by moment life, as Trevor just described, in seeing that. And in that, in that instance, off our cushion, that bit of analysis, in the, in the moment analysis, is the way we awaken. It's necessary to see things. But again, if we find ourselves getting lost in that, now let, me, let me take that back just a little bit. If we have developed a, a well-concentrated mind, we won't get lost in the analysis of things. We'll do it directly. When it's done, we'll move on to the next thought and the next breath. The third foundation of mindfulness is being mindful of your thinking process. With dispassionate mindfulness, notice how your thoughts evaluate impermanent qualities of your mind. Notice if your mind is agitated or peaceful. Notice if your mind is constricted or spacious. Dispassionately notice your thoughts 
attached to the quality of your mind, often driven by feelings. This begins to develop insight into how your thoughts have created confusion and suffering. With insight, with true Vipassana, you can begin to incline your mind towards release from clinging conditioned mind. Remember that jhana meditation is primarily used to develop unwavering concentration. I'm going to stop. That's a good place to stop. There's, that's about halfway through the chapter. But jhana, medit jhana means concentration. We use it to develop unwavering concentration. Why? So in this moment, I can apply the Eightfold Path appropriately. And it doesn't mean that in each and every moment in my life, I'm trying to figure out, well, is it right speech right now? Or am I, should I do a little right effort? Or maybe a little right. It, it just flows naturally from doing just what we're doing, from developing jhana practice. And I, every one of us has talked about uh, the overarching experience of right view and as it relates to all the other seven factors of the Eightfold Path and how in this moment, my view is that I'm either acting skillfully or not. And we've all, that's Dhamma practice. That's why we need concentration so that we can recognize what's the quality of my mind, that fourth foundation of mindfulness in this moment. And that's today's talk. Um, I'm going to hold on to, to Thane until later because I always go to him first and uh, give him a chance to hear what else is going on. So I'll, get, I'll catch up with you later, Thane. Anna, how are you this morning? It's good to see you. Uh, and thank you for that. Um, I, I, had the, uh, I had the urge. Of, we did that at Frenchtown Art School yesterday. And, and sometimes even simply, but for some reason, you know, thoughts overlap. And I wanted to participate. <laughs> and inside there's a in a okay. symbol of green flag. And um, I'm just gonna take the distract they're looking for. And and then there's the word anatta, which is part of the um, this week's chapter. Yeah. The self. Um, I had an interesting conversation with Matt. Matt says something about um, kimchi. <laughs> and there's an I in kimchi. And my last name is Kim from Korea. I know, it sounds really weird because I, <laughs> I associate with things and stuff, which I need to be mindful of knowing that I have unskillful thoughts and desires. And, and, um, and Matt goes, your kimchi is really good. And I said, make it because it's my way of communing with my mother who passed away from Korea. It's almost like it's been traditional life. But that in itself, I'm making the I making. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, I thought, I'm still making the I making. <clears throat> but there's, and I'm mindful of that. But at the same time, I'm still making kimchi. And I'm probably making kimchi for the rest of my life. I, I hope so. be buried in a kimchi jar. And I just <laughs> feel like, <clears throat> but I'm mindful of that, that I am making it, but I'm also making the I'm making. <clears throat> yep. But I, but there's a part of me that I enjoy it. So, but there's that clinging attachment, yep. which is, not part of the noble truth. Yep. So if I don't make it, then I'm not happy. <laughs> but I know I'm not happy. So I have to go back to I making, the kimchi making. Yep. Uh -huh. I am completely lost at this point. I'm sorry. I just feel like I'm going around circle. But then again, I'm I have the questions and I have the answer. But I know I still want to make kimchi, even though and I want to offer to people that itself is I making me by offering and to see other people enjoying it and then gratification I get it just creates more I making therefore I should just become an apple cabbage and I just I don't know yeah, I'm just I feel lost you came to the right place <laughs> <laughs> you uh Another way to, to, to describe what you said as lost is confused. Yes. That's the nature of a mind rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths because, and it's such a perfect example. Thank you, Anna. The, 
um, making kimchi, the immediate act of making kimchi, engaging in it, especially the way that you do it. Um, when I think of your cooking, I always think of that movie like Water for Chocolate. Everybody knows that. It, yes. Because it comes through. Um, and that's not something you have to give up. That's, that's being mindfully present with what's occurring. And in your case, making kimchi. Where you, the confusion is arising in your mind because of the strong connection that, with your mother. So when, as your mind deepens its concentration, you'll be able to separate that. While you were talking, I was thinking about me and my grandfather used to make sauces. And I still remember being 10 years old at his elbow, making, grinding up the, the pork butt and all those things, the things that he would say, and the, the things that he was, a, he was a bit of a character. Um, and so for a long time, that was, when I made sausage, I, was, I wasn't making sausage so much as I was spending time with my grandfather, just like you're doing with your mother. This is long after he died. Um, and I, it, I didn't have to go through a process of breaking that. And it's been a long time since I made sausage, but it's, it, those, those kind of clinging relationships aren't part of me anymore. And they, they, soon you will be able to get past the point to have a pleasant memory of your mother without connecting and clinging things, meaning ac activities with your mother. She'll just be part of your life, like everyone else's. Everyone has a mother. Almost everyone's mother passes away before they do. It's just a natural occurrence. There's nothing personal about it, no matter how extreme the situations might have been, whatever might have gone on between you and, you and your mother, whatever it is. It's just, a, it's just part of having a human life. So the idea of, so when I'm offering kimchi. When you're offering kimchi? To other people. Yes. Um, to strangers, to whomever. I don't really, there's no reciprocation. Like there's nothing I want from them. It just, I just do. Is there, do I stop doing that? Why would you? Because I'm eye making. Why? Why are you eye making? Because the, the smile on their face and that. That's why you're doing it? No, because I, think, I know it's good because I eat it. And I think it's also good for them to be that kind of provider to be all the scientists that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to cut. You. I don't. I don't mean to cut you off, yeah. but I am going to cut you off because you're 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 asking a speculative question about how you hope to be in the future, rather than just this is what's occurring right now. Right now, you may be engaging in eye making. In fact, I would say you likely are, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that you're developing the the eightfold path so that you have an opportunity to diminish it. You're recognizing it now, that's important. But don't let it be overwhelming. What I would say is continue with your Dhamma practice and these things will become clear for you. It, it, you don't need me to tell you, stop eye making with clinging to the memories of your mother. You will naturally develop that and it'll, it'll fall away. Um, the, most, the most important thing, Anna, is to just be very gentle with yourself. When you find that you're clinging, your kimchi making with memories of your mother, take a breath. And, and apply yourself to what's occurring right here and right now. And eventually it will resolve. It's the nature of the Dharma. Thank you for being here. Hello, Jen. Hi. Um, when Buddha fully awakened, he still did whatever. Yeah, it's just, you're just not taking it personal, that's all. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that's, that's a teacher. <laughs> that's a dumb teacher. So, um, there was a sutta that you sent out. Yep. Um, related to the Sama, the Sama Danga Sutta. Sama Danga Sutta. Right? Yep. And that, I think that's, because I looked, I looked at that after I read this chapter and um, it helped me with weight concentration in a way that um, kind of made me realize something that um, <clears throat> because of my own conditioned thinking and I'm making I um, the, 
the teachings on concentration. And we've had this conversation before, Jana, the loves of Jana, um, I always struggled with. It just wasn't going in, so mm. to speak. And um, so I read the sutta. And when I went back to the translation that you used to restore the teachings, um, I was able to, it, it got through for whatever reason. It got through my conditioned mind. Yeah. And it just kind of, um, solidified something for me that you, you know, I know we keep talking about what a great teacher you are <laughs> and you're tired of hearing it. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. <Yeah. laughs> keep it um, but, <clears throat> you know, there is a, a very subtle clinging to John's words that can happen where eventually you have to take responsibility for your own Dhamma practice and yeah. stop necessarily looking at your words and, and kind mm. of go out and find mm. for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. When you when you teach people, you teach them to a point and then you have to yeah. Send off the, on their way and say, "Hey, you, you, you have what you need. You need to now start, start learning for yourself. Yep. I, I can't teach you anymore." And so that's what I, that's what I realized this week. It really, it's outstanding, Jen. I had a all the time here. <laughs> but, but the sometimes these realizations can. I mean, they, we talked about this on our retreat. Yeah. It, the, you, the, the, it's so deep and poignant. It's hard not to get emotional sometimes. You know? And, you know, that that uh, the yeah, as as teachers, you're starting to have that realization. You when you become when you go through the teacher training, you start seeing the Dhamma a little bit differently, and yourself in relation to the Dhamma a little differently. Um, and so you realize that as a teacher, all that you can do. And I, I still remember, you know, this is 12 years ago, having that thought that if I'm going to teach this, I better be authentic. Because people are, you know, they're, they're spending their money and putting their times in here. It, 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 I have to be as authentic and real as I can in my knowledge and my presentation of the Dhamma. And then you got to let it go. But I, I, I think, I don't know that you'd ever get to that point of letting it go if you were creating your own dharma as opposed to teaching the buddhist dharma i think it'd be much more difficult because i'm simply presenting something the way that i learned it and the way it was taught to me i didn't it doesn't have my name on it you know it's not it's not haspel's dharma it's it's siddhartha's dharma um and when you understand it and when you understand the utter impersonal nature of the dharma you can't be a, a teacher that's taking it personally but it's an interesting thing because you know, I, I get to know all of my students pretty well. Um, and anybody that walks through that door, I have the skillful desire that they awaken. You know, but when people come and go, I'm not heartbroken, but I do notice that there's an opportunity lost. You know, that, and that reinforced, I remember talking to, I might have even been Ron, but certainly Matt over the years <clears throat> of, um, just becoming a better teacher for that purpose so that I know that I've done everything I can. But once you've done it, you've done it and you, you got to let it go. So thank you for bringing that up. Let me get that. Good morning, Lauren. Morning, everybody. Um, I think this morning I've realized um, being mind, when you are being mindful of your mind, um, And you catch yourself thinking about what you're thinking about, being mindful of your mind. The next, the next thought you have is either <coughs> negative towards yourself, or it's being gentle with yourself. Because mm -hmm. you just judge 
what you're thinking right there. Yeah. Um, so I know the the book that you're reading from is not written like this, but if you in the paragraphs or sentences that you've written, that you've read a lot uh, this morning, you can read a sentence and say and be gentle with yourself. Yeah. On the end of each yeah. sentence yeah. or paragraph or meaning or because it's right there. You're yeah. either negative towards yourself or gentle towards yourself. Yeah. So when we try to be mindful of ourselves, as I say, you could every time be gentle with yourself. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's it. Thank you. It's the key to the Dharma, you know, in each and every thought. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, John. <clears throat> I spent some time in the, the right effort or keep um, in this in the book and um, <clears throat> uh, looking back in my own practice is when I really got involved in the right effort. Um, was when I first really started taking up my, my own uh, meditation practice, mm -hmm. which was almost a couple of years into you know, coming here. And there was an effort of you know, showing up for class. Um, <coughs> but that was the first time that I really put effort into, into my practice. Um, and then... <coughs> Oh, it was the beginning of right effort, really. Yeah, the beginning yeah. of right effort. And then all of a sudden that started to um, bring up right intention, which I had to do it with, with the correct intention to, to start, you know, to, to be sitting there. And it took a while to actually get the actual intention of it, of it right. Yeah. Uh, which means I have, I, I've been working on my right, right view. <clears throat> Looking at, at my own practice, just from from that perspective, just again the um, the intricacy of the of the eightfold path is just amazing. It just everything supports you, and everything yeah. interacts with everything else. And um, once you once you put the right effort into it, it all starts to work. Yeah. And it all starts to bring up the other factors. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just astounding. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Thank you, Ron. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, everybody. So I'd like to read something from a brilliant author <laughs> <laughs> that I think really is something that sticks out. And I think that, that, that um, it's something that we've been talking about for weeks. Mindfulness is a dispassionate, focused awareness of whatever is arising in the present moment without being distracted by any judgments or discriminating thoughts. Being mindful of feelings and as feelings arise allows the feelings to dissipate and allows a deeper, deeper tranquility to develop. That is brilliant. That dispassion allows us to be gentle with ourselves. Yep. That dispassion and others. allows us not to react in a negative way. The, dis the discernment, the right view, with dispassion with regards to dependent originations, which are the feelings and reactions and thoughts that arise through ignorance, through using that eightfold path as that guideline to correctly see the way things as they are in the present moment. Um, this is the thing that I'm most grateful for, for from the Sangha, and from John, and from the Dharma, from the Three Jewels, um, and Buddha. So this concentration talk today is really coming from our first class of this uh, structured thing. So. Um, and to the sutta that Jen was describing, I read it too, and uh, we had a brief discussion on, on Tuesday about those levels of jhana and how, how uh, by the reduction of entanglements, we can, 
we can allow that immersion of concentration through jhana practice. So it all really intertwines beautifully. And I just think that paragraph that John wrote, when we struggle with those things <clears throat> and all these confusing things, and that's just a paragraph I always like to go back to. Me too. Thank, Thank you, you, Tim. <laughs> hey, Anthony, how are you? Good, thanks. Good. Sorry I haven't been able to make it. Thanks. Oh, you've missed it. You've been, you've been doing a lot of things in Miami. Um, but I want to congratulate Ron and Jen. Mm -hmm. And Jen's already learned the most important lesson, yeah. that, <laughs> that the teacher is simply a pointer yeah. to to what's the important thing, which is the Eightfold Path. And yeah. um, and I think it works both ways. Like the, the, the student can worship the teacher and the teacher can think that they're so great that they start to abuse their students. I mean, there's right. countless examples of yes. that in, in all of the different spiritual practices. Yeah. And um, it, it even may be even not good to call yourself a teacher because the people who you're just, <clears throat> you're just transporting some very important teachings um, and it's up to the person to actually grasp that and embrace it and do their own and do their own work. Yeah. Um, because if you think that you're a teacher, then you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself <laughs> and it's, and it, it, and you might, you know, you might actually impair your ability to teach by thinking you're a teacher. Um, Unless you apply the Dhamma to I that. Think yeah. I think around being yeah. Yeah. About being a teacher. I mean, really, it's the Dhamma that, that I, I, I say it all the time people see me as this wonderful teacher and I'll, I'll accept it. I think I am, but it's only because of the Dhamma that I am. Mm -hmm. So I interrupted yeah. you there. And, and Anna, I would just ask, what is kimchi? Mm -hmm. oh. Oh, boy. Do you like spicy I, foods? You have to eat it to believe it. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm like saying, come and see it for yourself. Yeah. Um, it's, um, it's, um, it, it's a poetry in your mouth. It's, it's, well, now I can understand why you love to give it to people. <laughs> yeah, and also it defined, it was the best conversation and most intimacy I had with my mother. And she passed away uh, when she was 32. And I feel like, anyway, so yeah. yes, the only way I could explain what it is to, for you to taste it. So I'll bring you uh, whenever you're coming and then uh, you could taste it for yourself. Oh, I'd love to. It's, if you, if Korea is kimchi, kimchi is Korea, there's no distinction. It's so embedded in everything about Korea. Yeah. You cry and you eat and you eat to cry. And it's, it's a very um, multi-man experience. It doesn't yeah. do its service, but it's, it's, it's fermented pickled cabbage and some other things. But Oh, I think I may have had that. And it's outstanding, especially the way Anna makes yeah, it. Yeah, the way I make it. So that there's, I don't, there's nothing wrong in giving people enjoyment with the food. Uh, you know, it's, and I, actually the Buddha taught the middle way, right? So you go about life and ah. you, you do what you find enjoyment in, but then you, you come back and you recognize if you're clinging mm -hmm. a little too much, maybe I'm clinging a little too much. But, you know, I just, I struggle with that also all the time because I can find myself on Facebook or something and then say, whoa, I just got too absorbed in this. You know, I need to pull back. And, I, you know, it's okay to give yourself a little, I give myself a little news maybe once a, on the weekends. You know, sometimes I go on Facebook and I get pulled into something political. But then, you know, the important thing is you just go about your life and you recognize that and you, that's the eightfold path. You know, because you can't exist in this world without the given tongue. Of the craving. Yeah, like what Lorna said, uh, is, uh, be gentle. Exactly. And then be mindful of the fact that you have all these thoughts, but exactly. knowing that it's okay. And then go out and make more kimchi. <laughs> That's right. I can't wait to try that kimchi. <laughs> and as we develop the Dhamma, we'll find areas in our life that will that will we'll notice the eye making and either diminish it or cut it out. You know, another, just like you just described, that's it. You're on Facebook, okay, I'm getting a little carried away. That's a, that's a thought related to the Dhamma, isn't it? It's a, yeah. It's a skillful thought. You can't exactly. go through life in a bubble because then you're not living your life. 
No, but you can make you can make your choices. If you find that situations that you are prone to eye making, most of them, not most of them, they will naturally fall away. It's just because you're no longer interested in it, you're not compulsed to do it. Yeah, that's interesting. And then even, <coughs> even your friendships change. Yeah. Because you realize that the people that you once thought were great friends uh -huh. are just engaged in way too much gossip and, and, and hateful sentiments that you just don't want to be with them anymore. Yep. You kind of reroute your life in a different way. Yeah, oh yeah. And, and <clears throat> your, the, um, your altruistic endeavors, such as giving someone food, will truly be altruistic because you won't be giving you won't be using your generosity to manipulate people in any way, even at some very subtle ways. Let me, mm -hmm. let me give you this because you'll like me a little more. That's eye making, but just to, just to offer something to some another human being is not eye making. It's when you're dispassionate about it, when it's, when it's given freely, being a Dhamma teacher is a good example of that. You know, that there's a, there's a, a practical reason why all these classes in most of my, written publications in the website are all donation based because they have to be you can't charge for this you know it, it just doesn't it doesn't work it doesn't it, it doesn't it, it it's incongruent but there also needs to be an exchange if i'm going to sit up here and do it i gotta you know i gotta make some money doing it just like again just in, during the buddhist time he was able to to get up and knock on a few doors and get his food for the day and close when he needed it if i do that here i'm gonna get put in jail Probably, <laughs> especially if I go in a tattered, tattered robe or a loincloth or something. Um, and it and it brings us the this middle way that Anthony mentioned that that Anna's you know the the, the middle way is to be Anna is such a good example is to be very very generous in the world without being attached to any of it because it's just an, it's just who we are. You know, when you're, when you're free of clinging, you tend to be free of clinging. In other words, you don't hold on to, to too much kimchi for yourself. <laughs> Trevor, good to see you this way. Thank you, Anthony. Good to see you, Trevor. Yeah, I didn't have any questions. I just wanted to express uh, my appreciation for the talks today with uh, what you said, meditation is for deepening concentration period. I wanted to thank Anna for your vulnerability. And, uh, now you've got something out of it. Yeah, I think it's really special <laughs> to be part of a song where uh, people share the struggle and yeah. the point of contact. You guys are all amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and also, just uh, I, I forgot your name over here. Uh, my, my Michael and Julia. Julia. Yeah, I appreciate Julia what you said about childbirth. The <laughs> ultimate pain and the, the recommendation is free. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trevor. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, John. I'll just speak for the previous 25 minutes. With five minutes <laughs> home. Gems? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I won't be able to take Jen, uh, I like the way you have put that, like, once you have gone to, obviously, to the point you're at now, and uh, uh, it comes to a point then, John, obviously, it's, it's, you see this clear, clearly from this vantage point. And that is, like, after you go through this process of becoming a teacher uh, and uh, living a Dhamma and <coughs> becoming a teacher and, and now putting it into your own words, as John so eloquently does, you know, that's to aspire to the way John does this is a, a great height. Uh, but I really like that um, you uh, perceive that and understand that, yes, it's time to, that's that's where it is. Basically, uh, if my, my quote, one of uh, my favorite shows on the uh, shifters, um, <laughs> I think it's a When you can snatch the pebble from my hand, it is time for you to leave. <laughs> Kung Fu, they <laughs> so when it's time for you to leave or journey on your own path and and, and teach the Dhamma, you know that's that's the time. That's the time for you to you you become the teacher and you forge that ahead on your own. So I just want to acknowledge you for recognizing that and you're well on your way. Thank you. I would, I would imagine so. so 
Uh, just segueing into something on uh, something else here. Um, uh, when we had uh, mentioned, uh, John, like uh, you had uh, like uh, the third foundation of mindfulness, and I'm just going to read this briefly because uh, I think there's a lot in it. It's just one paragraph, and, and I'll just like uh, just give a quick thought on that. The third foundation of mindfulness is being mindful of your thinking process. With this passionate mindfulness, as Tim said, notice how your thoughts evaluate and permanent qualities of your mind. Notice if your mind is agitated or peaceful. Notice if your mind is constricted or spacious. This passion let you notice your thoughts attached to the quality of your mind, often driven by feelings. This begins to develop insight into how your thoughts have created confusion and suffering. With insight, you can begin to incline your mind towards release from clean conditioned mind. Okay, uh, so, so much there, so deeply introspective, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, the four foundations of, of mindfulness. Uh, and, and this makes, makes us, makes me understand how, how personal this journey is. No one can, no one can take this journey but ourselves, guided by obviously yourself, John, and, and now the newly formed teachers. So, um, and just like a, a reference to this, uh, or what I think when I read this is, uh, uh, again, quality of our mind is such an important thing to be consciously aware of. Uh, you know, just to just to be to know where it's at throughout our day. Uh, just what is it that's causing, you know, this discord, or why am I feeling this way? And I directly relate the way I feel, the way, the quality of my mind, to the, uh, to where I am on, you know, like the, uh, the integration process of the, of the uh, Eightfold Path. Uh, because if, my, if the Eightfold Path is in integrated properly, then the quality of my mind will be aligned with the depth of my understanding and incorporating uh, the Eightfold Path. So I just wanted to make that point. <laughs> Thank you. That's beautifully said. Mm -hmm. And that is your, well, let me ask you then, what's your, <clears throat> what's your personal relationship with the Dhamma like? My personal relationship? Um, just as I said, like, uh, I, I, I notice, uh, Pay attention. I notice the quality of my mind, okay. and I, if I have discord uh, or if I, my mind isn't in a place of peaceful abiding, then I, 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 I seek to, I seek to, to uh, understand what is the what is causing this, you know, um, uh, and obviously, um, uh, I, I, obviously I, I meditate. Very consistently, and uh, um, and I do take a breath or two when I have to to get myself back to that eightfold breath. Yeah. Beautiful, Michael. If I'm distracted or distressed in this moment, it's because of wrong thinking, because I'm clinging to a wrong view, and that's all the information I need. And then in the next breath, I become very gentle with myself and move on with my life. If I do anything else, I'm, st I'm still stuck in my own fabrications, aren't I? Mm -hmm. It's just recognition, abandonment, come back to what's occurring in the present moment. That's Dhamma practice. Mm -hmm. and just, and recognize just, what is skillful, recognize what is unskillful, and develop what is skillful. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, what you had heard, said earlier today, nothing is personal. Mm -hmm. It doesn't yeah. matter what it is, and it doesn't matter what occurs or unfolds before us. Whatever it is, it's going to be. It's up to us to navigate yep. around this. You can't find anything in the world. A punch in the face is not personal. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. I might have a little bit to do with you. But... <laughs> oh, thank you, Michael. Hello, Julia. Hello, John. Um, I'll just read my summary because I have to summarize everything. Otherwise, it's not digested. But, um, truth has to be known directly. Mindfulness has a reflective quality to it. In mindfulness awareness, the mind is deliberately kept in a dispassionate, detached observation of what is happening within ourselves and around us in the present moment. 
with dispassionate witnessing, the mind is trained to remain present in peaceful equanimity and alert contemplation of the moment as life unfolds. All judgments, fabrications, and interpretations are suspended, or as they occur, are allowed to rise and pass away. Life is just as it is, occurring with no personal attachment. We stand firmly in mind and body, joined in dispassionate equanimity, not getting swept away by distracting thoughts or sensations. The practice of mindfulness is a matter of undoing the doing of our mind and all its distractions to create I. Knots and tangles to establish by manipulative ego dominance. In mindfulness, the mind watches in dispassion as occasions arise and pass away. There is no clinging, no grasping to our desires, only sustained contemplation, persistent sustained contemplation in a calm and peaceful state. In this place, there is serenity, discernment, and wisdom. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. How are you, Dathane? Hello, Dathane. Yeah, I'm here. Hold on a second. <laughs> Good to hear you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you, you're, you're, you really uh, changed my um, my view about uh, right effort. Um, when I when I was reading when I read your um, uh, you know, becoming Buddha that section, I was curious. I'm like, where is he pulling this from? So I, I researched those, and I saw you. I saw, if I'm not mistaken, you pulled it from the Great Forty um, Sutta, where it it, it really um, uh, assists in one's understanding that right effort, right mindfulness, all orbits the Eightfold Path. Yep. And uh, because I mean, I've been in the Dharma practice for a while, and you know, mindfulness of you know the steps, and you know, mindfulness of the breath, and it seems that that it becomes a little bit divorced from the original intention of it orbiting the eightfold path. Yeah. So um, I like to thank you for that, you know, that teaching. That was really, that was really great. It helped me to really clarify what skill for effort is all about. Um, the one, the, the thing that, that, that kind of causes me the, the pause um, uh, I remember in your in your discussion. Uh, I, th I think we talked about this before, I, and maybe it's because I'm still unconvinced. <laughs> um, there's there's this, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, view that you know that to do outside. I don't know. Let me, let me ask you as a question. You know, when it comes to um, individuals engaging in good works in the world, like you know, human trafficking and um, you know, back in the day, abolition, um, you know, these are, these are systems and issues that either you can assist in changing it, or you cannot. And so um, the, the, um, what's the word, the position, the kind of position that you have as a Dharma practitioner, in, in regards to engaging un injustice in the world, um, uh, if, if you could, you know, um, speak on that a little bit, um, the, the, the need to, because on the one hand, you know, to not to, to, to solely focus on one's own practice and one's own liberation is wonderful. I'm all about that. Very much all about that. But to, you know, if, for example, I'm, you know, um, working on my own practice during the time of slavery and, you know, I'm not getting into the abolitionist movement <laughs> because I'm working on my own liberation. I find that to be a bit of an injustice, a bit of a, 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 a that, that I should, um, if I see injustice, you know, respond. So what's your, what's your kind of take on that? Well, it, it's, a, it's a very deep question. Um, and uh, it's something we could probably talk about for days. Uh, but I'll, well, we got, we got days, don't we? Um, <laughs> Worldly conditions have nothing at all to do with Four Noble Truths or developing understanding of Four Noble Truths. Uh, the Four Noble Truths explains slavery and human trafficking. Um, it explains hatred and aggression in the most profound and, and understandable way. It's rooted in greed and aversion and deluded thinking. 
So the, the most effective response that I can give to the um, expressions of, of interhuman hatred that are still present and will always continue is to take to the Dhamma and awaken. And along the way, to practice right speech, right action, and right livelihood, so I am certain that I'm not contributing to any of the stress and suffering in the world. And then that alone is doing more than almost every human being is doing right now to bring those things to cessation. And an understanding of the Buddha's Dhamma tells me that until human ignorance is ended, which it will likely never be, there's going to be slavery, human trafficking, drug addiction, hatred, people punching each other, people hating, all the whole thing is always gonna continue no matter how against it I am. And most human beings, unless, true psych unless they're a true psychopath, and that's very, very rare in the world, cares about other people and does not, do not wanna see other people hurt, except those same people will hurt other people, usually inadvertently. And they do it because of ignorance. So again, if I really care about ending all the, all the ills of the world, I can't, I can't really say it that way because that's not the motivation. If I want to be certain that I'm not contributing to the ills of the world, I practice the Dhamma. And then I know that my good acts will have a positive influence. If I also feel like I hear that there's going to be a rally tonight in Frenchtown, um, you know, as I'm talking, I'm saying I, I probably would <clears throat> rally against Frenchtown against continued racism. And I was about to say I, I would attend, but I probably wouldn't attend because I know that I'm going to be a, a, amongst a lot of people that are just acting out of rage and that that's not helpful. And in that way, I'm supporting it. So the, again, to answer your question, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be involved in the world, but as Dhamma practitioners, as, as those of us that truly understand the nature of human suffering, we'll take to the Dhamma and awaken. That's the most effective thing we can do. So there's my answer. <laughs> And that's a that's a very that's a very good answer. Thank no, you. No, thank you. It, it's it's an ongoing um, issue even within um, authentic Buddhist practice, but the I would say the the largest form of the largest form of practice that's called Buddhism, even though it doesn't have any real Buddhism about it, is called engaged Buddhism. That's the that's the modern type of Buddhism, and so we have millions of practitioners that consider themselves Buddhism Buddhist but their only practice of Buddhism is to be against something. And even if it's something that, you know, is a good thing to be against, it's not Buddhist practice, is it? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it doesn't define you at all as, or, or it, it has no potential to develop awakening just because I, I am um, socially aware. That, that, that doesn't, that's kind of meaningless, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's how, how am I seeing myself in relation to the world in this moment? And if there's any greed, aversion, or deluded thinking, I've lost to Dhamma, meaning wanting something to be different, including the conditions that we all think should be different. They, they, and the reason why they aren't different to Thane and everyone else, the reason why there's still racism and slavery and all the other things, you, hum, hum, human beings haven't changed at all <clears throat> since the beginning. All the atrocities that we've ever caused on each other, are, we're still doing right here, right now, today. What's the constant? What's the constant in human history? Ignorance. Ignorance. What's the one thing that hasn't been addressed? We've tried all kinds of different things, different legislations, more powerful armies, Star Wars. Nothing works, does it? We just keep, we keep killing ourselves day after day. We keep hating each other day after day. Why? Because we don't know we're doing it. If, if I really care about you and you and everybody else, if I really do, if I'm sincere to myself, not to you, doesn't matter what you think about me. What matters is how I think about me in relation to you. And if I'm full of hatred, it's up to me to end it. It's not for me to tell you, you have to go out in the world and end hatred, then I'll stop. If I really care about ending hatred in the world, and I really do care about ending hatred in the world, I'm going to take to the Dhamma and awaken and stop contributing, like I did for many, many years, to the pain and suffering of others in this world, including myself. And as I've developed the Dhamma, I've found that as far as I can tell, I'm completely harmless towards others. And as far as I can tell, I'm completely harmless towards myself. That is a it's got, That brings me to tears to say it. Because for years and years and years, I did everything I can 
to beat the hell out of myself, to kill myself, mm -hmm. and to hurt other people inadvertently. Mm -hmm. The only thing that changed in that equation is a dhamma. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you, Greg. That's yes, very Tim. The things discussing the, the virtuous, the virtue factors of, of the Eightfold Path and the concentration factor that we're talking about today mm -hmm. with the wisdom factors are it, the wisdom factors and the, and, the, and the concentration factors are very introspective. Yes. As you said, whereas the virtue factors, those, those, those wisdom factors and concentration factors, introspective, kind of merge into those virtue factors of how we so it becomes a state of being then. Right. Yeah. Out, outwards. And and what you just described is was beautiful. Because dispassionately and without any self referential feeling, how do how do I stop hatred by me practicing the Dhamma and and do my virtuous acts showing that? Yeah. That, thank you. And that's right. And and you see the point that if I insist that the world stop hating before I stop hating, I'll never stop hating, will I? But if I'm the only person in the world that has figured out a way to stop hating themselves and others, that's pretty good. You know, it's not enough, but it's pretty good. Anthony. Can, uh, can, can we exercise right action by selecting a means to achieve social justice in a way that's compatible with the Dharma? For example, joining um, Gandhi, or Martin Luther King, or in South Carolina, when that uh, nationalist came in and shot up the church, they met together as a congregation and had a mass to pray for his forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are ways that we can engage in social justice that fit within the definition of right action. Well, they did. The, the, all of those scenarios that you described, people were engaged in a measure of right action, weren't they? Mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King was, was certainly doing that, and the people that joined with his movement there's nothing um, in a, I couldn't make a blanket statement and say that all of those people were acting completely with right effort and, right. and just integrity because they weren't. I mean, there's even just using, I don't even know how to go, go there without, using the example I just gave, there were many people within that organization that were very helpful towards the cause, but were also hurtful towards other people at the same time. And that's kind of historically known, even though we don't want to talk about it. And I'm only, I'm only making the action. point that though, though all of those things are part of the world. They're part of they're, they're what people do in the world. People do fight for in different ways. They, they fight injustice and, and those types of things. That's all part of the world. It, 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 it's all described as the first noble truth. And if as an individual, I think there's some value in me, um, joining the next Mr. Martin Luther King or whoever it might be. And I make that decision well framed by the Eightfold Path, then I'm probably not going to cause harm. But as someone who understands what's most helpful, it doesn't mean that I'm not concerned about other people when I don't jump on the, the latest bandwagon either. So there, there's, there, it's, it's almost impossible. In fact, I would say it's impossible for anybody on the outside to understand another person's motivation, whether it, if it's pure or not, yeah, yeah, or if yeah. there's eye making in it. So there's no sense, you could really say there's no sense in even talking about it, but here I go. But what I, what I do know is what's right for me. And I, and, I, and I honestly do not know what's right for another human being. I would, stay, I would say that I think it would be best if everybody would learn the Eightfold Path. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna happen, but that's as far as I know what's good for you. It really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can't, I don't feel like we can sit around and talk about that on somebody else's right action. Yeah, only well, we, they know what their right action it, it, is. Yeah, only, only, yeah, only individuals know what their motivation is for something. And it might be pure, it might be full of eye making. Again, just using the example of the Crusades or the modern jihadists, they were full of eye making, weren't they? And they caused a lot of pain for themselves and others. It's just a good example. But we do that all the time, too. Yeah. Michael. John, uh, that was a, a, a great passionate. Um, I must say, I feel like uh, gathering a, a group, uh, getting pitchforks and torches and storming Frenchtown right now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll show them. <laughs> but the speech was, the speech was <laughs> tremendous. Um, I, really was. I, just, I hung on every word. It was beautifully, beautifully done. Thank you.
Thank you. See you Tuesday. See you Tuesday. Great. Uh, thank you, Mike. I mean, it really is when when you um, when you boil it all down. It really is the the you could say that the Buddha's Dhamma. Once we've developed the right mindfulness, is a matter of remaining harmless to ourselves and others. That's the result of it. And again, not everybody's going to do it. But imagine if everybody did. Mm -hmm. Imagine if just 40 people did it. We've got 30 people doing it right now. And honestly, we have made, I think every one of you would say this. I'm just looking at Anna because she's new, but I think she would say this too. That the people that you are closest with, your family, maybe some coworkers, and certainly our community here is better because of your Dhamma practice. Is that true? That's it. But, but that's it. That's how it works. And again, there's no magic to it. The more people that develop it, the more impact we've had. But we are, we are, we are the results of authentic Dhamma practice. We're, we're learning to be harmless towards ourselves and to, and to all those around us. And it's actually working, right? So let's keep doing it. And again, we're not, the Buddha didn't see himself as a savior. He didn't teach a salvific religion. He taught a way to resolve our own issues, to understand who we are in relation to the world. If his charge was to end all suffering, then he's a failure, isn't he? He's an abject failure because he didn't end suffering at all. But he didn't start out to do that. He set out and was successful in teaching how to understand suffering. And an understanding of suffering is, as a consequence of having a human life, suffering occurs. That's it. Thank you all for a wonderful question. Any other questions or comments before I, we close? I just say one more Please. Thing. I'm sorry. Cause don't be, don't be. I, I you're emotional. a teacher now. You don't have to apologize yeah. for anything. Since I got emotional, I got a little, like, I kind of got off the rails for what I wanted to, the point I wanted to make, which was that. Um, first of all, I don't feel like you have to go through teacher training in order to take responsibility for your own Dhamma practice. No, don't tell them that. And I think, <laughs> <laughs> but I also think that if you are, I think it's easy. Well, for me, I don't want to speak for anybody else. My conditioned mind would, would have had a more passive approach my practice which i think i'm not judging it's, it's what it was and it worked and it was good um but you may see that it changes mm. or flip-flops and it's time to to develop um kind of take charge of developing a deeper practice mm -hmm. um and the abandon what is unskillful and develop what is skillful i think that second part of the sentence develop what is skillful is not just abandoning what is unskillful mm -hmm. it's other things it's, it's developing something skillful. you have to develop it and you have to yeah. have the confidence in your own self-reflection in your own development of the Dhamma and say to yourself, okay, I know that I have abandoned enough to begin purposeful development. Something with um, what Anna said, where initially you, you're confused about where the, what's the, what is I making and what isn't, even within the Dhamma, you start to abandon everything. I need to not be, I need to not think about anything, or I need to not think about certain things, or I need to not think about the Dhamma in this way. And it's not. There is a procedure manual here for us. Yeah. Yeah. And we just have to study it and apply it. And that development part to me was, so it was lost on me. I'm still like, I literally, I ran that sutta yesterday. Um, Thank you. Thank you. That's outstanding. But what you're describing is ongoing right effort. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, you, you began with initial right effort that kept you focused on the Dhamma, and it brought you, your continued right effort brought you to this place today 
that shows you, okay, I need a little bit more practice here. I need to apply it in, in, in more um, maybe direct ways than you have been. But that's just developing Dhamma practice. It's just that way. You see it differently. You know, the, the concentration it can be looked at as the skill we develop because it is a skill. You know, we don't we don't tend to think of concentration as a skill, but we know it is. We 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 do something. We lift the weights of mindful mindfulness of the breath to develop that skill of concentration. And it is that skill that supports the quality of mind of refined mindfulness that can incorporate the eightfold path. It takes that it takes that skill that that concentration. Anna, um, I was reading the chapter for this week with my daughter. She doesn't understand all the words, and she was reading it out loud. I was helping her with the sound afterwards. And she said the most beautiful thing. She said, Mom, have you ever looked at me with words? Wow. I didn't know. Jeez. And I said, do you understand what it's saying? She said, no, it's beautiful. I don't understand it. I don't either. She's like, no, it's like a poem. And I was like, wow. Like my eight-year-old daughter says more. Even though she says she doesn't understand it, she understands more than I could possibly understand it. So she's like my teacher. <laughs> so I was like, I was like in awe of my daughter. And she said, Mom, you know, she said, these words are big words. He uses a lot of big words. <laughs> yeah, I do. And she said, but they sound awful. That simple way of her saying that was just. I am too. Yeah, so, yeah, you're a poet. Aren't we all? I never, I never thought of myself that way. We're poems in progress. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll finish as we always do. <laughs> so find your relaxed meditative posture. Gently close your eyes. Gently close your mouth. Just become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied. Unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, Free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class this morning. Peace. Thanks for joining the Thane. Talk to you soon. <clears throat> <laughs> it's just my way. Yes. I try not to take it personal, but it's just my way. <laughs>